By the end of 1861, the war between the North and South was far from over. Both the Union and Confederate armies had managed to mobilize a massive number of men into military service, and the animosity between North and South grew to enormous proportions. However, despite having a larger army, as well as a massive economic and industrial advantage over the Confederacy, the North suffered several major defeats in the first year of the war. Especially damaging were the strategic losses of Fort Sumter, the destruction of the naval shipyards at Norfolk, and the loss of men and morale from the defeat at Manassas. But Abraham Lincoln was unwilling to compromise or negotiate with the rebels. Convinced that part of the military's difficulty was with its antiquated leadership, Lincoln replaced Winfield Scott as commander of the Union Army with 34-year-old George McClellan. General McClellan had already distinguished himself in battle by leading a force of Ohio and Indiana volunteers against rebel forces in western Virginia. Moreover, McClellan displayed a boundless enthusiasm in his new role as commander of the Union Army of the Potomac. Shortly after his appointment, McClellan wrote to his wife, I find myself in a strange position here. The president and the cabinet are all deferring to me. By some strange operation of magic, I seem to have become the power of the land. McClellan immediately set out to reorganize the Union Army. In comparison with Winfield Scott, McClellan was known to embrace new technology in order to get an advantage over his opponent on the battlefield. It was McClellan's intention to utilize the strategic advantage of telegraphic communications, the railroad, steam-powered water transports, ironclad fighting ships, and aerial reconnaissance. Thaddeus Lowe's Balloon Corps fit well in McClellan's plans to acquire as much intelligence concerning rebel movement as possible. In addition to the Balloon Corps, McClellan also enlisted the services of numerous civilian and military scouts and professional spies. Alan Pinkerton, President Lincoln's bodyguard, was chief among the Union Army's new Secret Service. In many ways, Pinkerton's intelligence gathering would have a profound effect on the early part of the war. However, that effect would not always result in a positive benefit for the Union Army's war efforts. Meanwhile, Thaddeus Lowe continued to build upon his newfound success. He had managed to establish a good relationship with General McClellan, and the construction of the eight new military balloons was finally accomplished. Lowe had even managed to add a new concept in military operations, the ability to use his balloons over rivers. Adding his portable hydrogen generators to the deck of the Navy barge, the George Washington Park Custis, Lowe's watercraft became, in essence, the first aircraft carrier in military history. While Thaddeus Lowe may have finally had the support of the Union Army's military leadership, there was still one unresolved issue for Lowe to deal with before he could fully assume his role as chief aeronaut for the Union Army Balloon Corps, John LaMontagne. John LaMontagne continued to use the tattered remains of the Atlantic balloon until it ceased to be airworthy. Upon learning that Thaddeus Lowe had eight new military balloons in storage at the Columbia Armory in Washington, D.C., LaMontagne demanded that he be allowed to use one of them. Armed with an order from the commander of Fort Monroe, LaMontagne attempted to take possession of one of the new balloons, but was prevented by Clovis Lowe. The controversy was to be resolved between the two rival aeronauts where LaMontagne would have received one of the new balloons. However, Lowe refused to work with LaMontagne on no uncertain terms. As Lowe said, LaMontagne is a man known to be unscrupulous. He has tampered with my work and has stopped at nothing to injure my reputation. With Lowe's refusal to work with La Montaigne, along with Lowe's closer relationship to General McClellan, La Montaigne was left without any recourse. Without any means to continue its aerial observations at Fort Monroe, John La Montaigne faded into history. In the spring of 1862, General McClellan was preparing the Union Army of the Potomac for a massive offensive against the Confederacy. McClellan had taken over the command of the Army in the fall of 1861, but he spent several months of reorganizing his men into a precision fighting organization. Cautious in his approach to combat, the various units of the Army of the Potomac were drilled to the point of peak efficiency. 
the Union Army's morale had reached new heights by March of 1862. Urged by Lincoln to act decisively, McClellan planned to strike at the heart of the Confederacy by capturing its capital in Richmond, Virginia. By the spring of 1862, the number of men in the Army of the Potomac numbered over 150,000. However, instead of invading Virginia over land, McClellan's plan was to transport his army over water from Washington, D.C. to Fort Monroe. From there, the Army of the Potomac was to make its way up the Virginia Peninsula in order to capture Richmond. Thaddeus Lowe and the Union Army Balloon Corps were to play a critical role in the Union Army's invasion of Virginia. In April of 1862, Lowe was ordered to prepare himself, his assistant aeronauts, several balloons, the portable hydrogen gas generators, and the balloon boat for transport to Fort Monroe. As McClellan's Army of the Potomac gathered its full force on the Virginia Peninsula, the mission for the Balloon Corps became critical for its advance. Working in tandem with military observers and map makers from the Union Army Corps of Topographical Engineers, Lowe and his assistant aeronauts initially provided aerial reconnaissance of enemy positions on the approach to Richmond. In addition to providing assistance to Union map makers, military observers in Thaddeus Lowe's balloons also had the ability of pinpointing the movement of Confederate troops from great distances. They also had the ability of spotting the strength of Confederate artillery. Using powerful field glasses and telescopes from altitudes of 1,000 feet or more, it was possible for Union observers to tell the difference between real Confederate cannons and decoy Quaker cannons made from wooden logs. When Union artillery batteries actually encountered real Confederate cannons, they were often unable to see their opponents directly due to the terrain. It was in these instances that Lowe's balloons provided another unique service. By using the onboard telegraph that ran along the tether lines from the balloon to the ground, Observers in the balloons could precisely direct Union gun batteries to open fire on Confederate positions. It marked the first time in military history that artillery barrages were accurately directed from the air to an unseen enemy position on the ground. With the Confederate Army possessing some of the most accurate sharpshooters of any military organization, it has often been wondered how it was not possible to shoot down one of the Union Army's balloons. Every time Lowe and his assistants ascended, a barrage of bullets and cannon fire would erupt from rebel lines. However, the balloons were kept well behind Union protected artillery batteries far out of range of Confederate guns. Even when Confederate artillerymen concentrated their weapons at one of Lowe's balloons, the results were negative. The balloons were out of range of even the most powerful Confederate cannons. The trajectory of a shell would fall far away from its intended target. In some extreme cases, Confederate artillery chiefs would attempt to raise their cannons higher than normal to take down the Yankee balloons. Often the end result would be cannon explosions caused by breached barrels. Thaddeus Lowe continued to innovate and improve the performance of his balloons throughout the Peninsula Campaign in Virginia. When a telegraph operator wasn't available to signal observations from one of the balloons, Lowe developed a signal flag system that could be used instead. And when members of McClellan's staff required nighttime reconnaissance, Lowe developed a powerful gas-powered lamp that could illuminate the surrounding area.